How you doing? Hey, John, Equus, Caesar, Dom, Goldfinger, Eco. <laughs> How is the is the uh, sound and video okay? Everything working on your end? Hey, Clyde, how's it going? Can you guys hear okay? Is the, is the sound all right? All good. Oh, great. Thanks, Big Sal. <laughs> hey, neighbor. Good morning, good morning. Hi, Lazard. I was uh, winding and, and setting my uh, Larique. Can't wear it all the time, no. <laughs> Got on my um, Langenheim. This is another watch I like. It's just easy to look at and easy to tell the time. Hey, Philip. Keep looking through online and uh, hunting smaller jewelry shops. Oh, after Christmas, the great time to go hunting. Huh, that is a good tip. I like that. You know that, what I was thinking? I, I'm going to have a, a video on this for uh, Monday. But um, I'm thinking one way to find, well, uh, let me back things up. When people are looking for a good watch deal, they can be looking for very different things as a good deal. Uh, for example, uh, someone may be looking for a good resale value. I mean, they say, well, if I if I buy this watch, I'll be able to resell it uh, for, you know, for either at least as much as I put into it or as a profit. Um, or they may be looking for some kind of, of horology that, is something like a dual barrel with a set in parallel or a Rimantois Galate or something like that. You know, there are a lot of different things that, that you can find and you can look for. Or they may have be looking for a style uh, that they like, you know. So I, I think that in terms of tips for finding things, we got to figure out, you know, what would be, you know, t t the best deal being the best, be best deal for what? Anyway. Caesar, let's see, best tip was given by, oh, yeah, steady and acquire knowledge. Yeah, I, Caesar, to tell you the truth, I still think that's the best, the best tip. I, I really do because of, the, one of the things I think that is the most difficult is to is to know when you're looking at something that's a really good deal. I mean, you can be looking at something and uh, you know, but then you find out that that one is is really good. Uh, one of the things I know that um, sometimes I'll wait for a good deal to come along, but then I'll know it when I see it when the um, I'd wanted an Urban Jurgensen for a long time. I just couldn't afford it though. They were like thirty. They started around thirty thousand or something like that. And I just, you know, when one came along, when they, when they had the, uh, when, um, oh, what's his face, um, Del Rey watches had all of the, all of the ones that they were dumping when they sold it, and all of the prices were almost at half price then it was recognized as, oh, th that's a good buy. Um, in terms of the the rest of it, I mean, it was a good buy because it was a good watch, not just because it was a good buy. Sometimes, you know, some junk will be out there and they cut it, keep cutting it down to, you know, clear the inventory. Mm. 
get to know uh, other collectors, find local groups, uh, both line and yeah. You know, that is another great idea, uh, Clyde. I like that. I, I think um, I've sold a couple watches. I've mentioned that I'm selling watches and uh, a couple ones and, and people have gotten in touch with me and say, well, if you haven't sold it yet, uh, you know, what do you, you know, and, and that's so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Oh, you like Lang and Heim, Yeah, me too. <laughs> I liked it better when uh, Marco Lang was there, but, you know, well, this I got this when Marco Lang was there, so that counts. Sometimes uh, pawn shops can be beneficial, and many of them uh, don't advertise online. Yeah. Um, I've got a Vassarone Constantin 1972 from a pawn shop that I think that it was one of those places the guys have, you know, they weren't quite sure what they had. Uh, and it was sort of an odd looking watch. And uh, they gave me a good price on it. The guy was, see, uh, pawn shop owners oftentimes, oh, I'm tough, you know, and I'm not going to screw around with this and stuff. But on the other hand, they're, they're realistic too. Hey, Lee. Good morning. How you doing? Yeah, you did, Lee. And we're, and we're not telling it to you. <laughs> hey, Philip. Many large department stores with Jewish shops will allow you the special order watches from suppliers during watch sales. Oh, yeah. That's a good... I hadn't even thought of that. That's a, that's a really interesting idea. Morning, Junior. Hey, Brian. It's about time you got here. <laughs> oh, I think I. This is this is what I was I was thinking of is that um, is to look at watches you know you can't afford and you probably never can afford. For me, uh, you know, you have things like. Um, uh, Roger Smith and Philippe Dufour and uh, Grubel and Forse and a lot of those guys. You can't those to me. I I just take a look at and figure you know there's no way I can afford those unless I win the lottery. And even then, they may be tough. But the point is is that by looking at those watches, you can find some really good stuff. They say, well, what is it about so and so's watch that seems to be valuable or seems to be a characteristic of it. Uh, this is this is exactly how I got into my low frequency thing. I, I looked at all of these top watches by top watchmakers and they all had uh, two and a half, three hertz, you know, and so I thought, well, there must be something about that. And um that was more of an empirical thing rather than or what's the logic of it, but then the, sort of demanding the reasons for that, you know, less wear and tear, uh, longer uh, uh, reserve, a lot of things like that. But anyway, I, you know, I, I somehow, no matter what anybody tells me, I, I <laughs> talk about a belief, I do believe that with lower frequencies, you got to have a better watch. I, I just think that. I mean, in other words, everything else has to be more um, more precise. We used to have a saying when, when, I, when I used to fly, um, which people would talk about airplanes as being more forgiving. I said, oh, that airplane is pretty forgiving. Um <laughs> <laughs> Any airplane is forgiving if you know what you're doing. But um, there were some, I guess, that were, if you screwed up, uh, you wouldn't go into a suicidal spin or something like that. Um, and I think this the same is true with certain watches, is that there's a, if you have a higher frequency, they're more forgiving. And they'll get keep accurate time. On the other hand, if you have lower frequency, you have to have more 
more precision, more precise elements to it. Now, that's a belief of mine. And because I have asked watch makers if that's how come they're lower frequency, and they told me no. <laughs> so I don't believe them. Okay, what do you got here? Um, or you could try visiting Japan and look for great deals here. Um, especially on uh, vintage watches. Yeah, I'm not much into vintage watches. One of the things, though, I found that come out of Japan and China, a lot of times there's these larger sizes. They're not as popular over there, but that's not a bad idea. Or go online with vague search terms to wrestle these items from the uninformed and disinterested. A lot of people... Uh, buy stuff up to without bothering to learn what it really is that's a good point uh rancher that's a really good point estate sale mm. hey brian my my wife is running a blood drive today i had to be a husband and, and help set it up that is nice you know it's really funny um i, I found out you know they have some really funny rules about uh about blood drives and things and in 19 in 1984 i was at cambridge university as a visiting scholar and during that period there was some kind of mad cow disease out in uh i guess somewhere in in england and so uh i i went to give blood and they said oh you can't do it because of you know <laughs> mad cow disease and that was it and i because i've always believed in and you know donating to help people out if, you know, <laughs> so but i said no you can't donate it because there was mad cow disease back what 50 years ago or something never mind okay that's a good thing hey caesar let's see uh build a watch group and create a bespoke one from switzerland what a crazy idea, Caesar. Nobody in their right mind would do anything like that. <laughs> That's just nuts. So, Haley, it's okay. I can't keep a secret. I use a Russian spy from 1960. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> Boy, that's harsh, rancher. <laughs> okay. Hey, Dominic, let's see. Chrono 24 can be a good source. I do make offers even if I think they are too low. It usually starts a deal. Great point, Dominic. That is, and sometimes you get it. I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> I, you're not planning. You figure, oh, I'm going to throw something out there just, just because. And you do that. Okay, you got a deal. And uh, <laughs> you better want it, too, because I, I can. I think I had one time when I sold something. I didn't, I didn't sell very much on Chrono 24. I don't have anything against it, but I had just haven't done it. And one day I did it, and somebody had an offer. And I said, yeah, that's that's reasonable. and then they ghosted <laughs> they were gone and i i wonder if you know if you get a record of doing that on chrono 24 they'll they'll ghost you too ah, no you can't you can't buy from anymore because you don't show up i hope not um but that's a good point JC, airplanes are not forgiving, especially with current uh, incidents like Boeing with their sketchy uh, MCAS. No, I guess not. <laughs> the, you know, the thing is, JC, when I flew, I was very much a stick and rudder guy. Um, our plane didn't have a lot of stuff. It didn't have de-icing. It didn't have... Uh, autopilot it had none of those things you had to fly from the time you took off until you landed until you parked it actually uh the uh parking in an airplane and driving it around was that can that in and of itself you, know, you got these long wings sticking out either side and you got to watch what you're doing 
I don't remember you talking about uh, Panerai. Lots of hype and not to. Uh, John, I think this, I did, I have talked about Panerai. Hasn't been good talk, but I've talked about them. <laughs> All right. Panerai is, it's really, it's one of those brands that I really like the looks of Panerai. I've always liked the looks of them, but I don't trust them. I just, God knows, you know, you have, you know, it's sort of like the the 318 scandal really, at least in my mind it did, is that, you know, if they're going to do that with that watch, you know, they had a solid back, the, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge and so forth. But man, I tell you, I just like something about it, like, you know, why bother? I, they don't, I can't think of anything horologically splendid that uh, that they did. I like the idea of sort of the history with the World War II Italian frogman. That's sort of cool. But otherwise, I just don't. There's something about them. Their their shoes, their socks squeak. (laughs) Hey, watch, Nicholas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you got a Panerai fan? Okay. Like the looks of them. Panerai can't even authenticate their own watches. <laughs> well. Yeah, you, you have to take a chance. Yeah, well, you know, you the you you reduce the chanciness of it with the more knowledge you have of it. Like, I I probably took an unnecessary chance when I bought the Alexa because I wasn't sure about the movement, and um, the uh, maybe I did. I don't remember. Uh, I know there's oh boy, that's white gold and so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Suck up goober. Yeah, Panerai's gorgeous watches. I think the um thing about Panerai is that they have, it's sort of a interesting, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing, but uh, they have those huge uh, crown guards. And I, I don't know, it's something about them that gives them a certain type of rough and tumble authenticity if they need a crown guard. They must, you know, be for tough work. Maybe a, being a frogman and going out and <laughs> sinking ships. Ah, Rancher. Rancher's got one of the golden rules, and that's patience, and I couldn't agree more. I hear the best about Panerai is the owners. They have some amazing groups. You know, that's it. I, I, there's probably not a, a good watch that doesn't have a good group. And that's important, I think. Um, and, and, and you're right about that, uh, Dom. Random question. What's the best watchmaker ever to you? What's the best watchmaker I keep uh, something that rushes to my head immediately is Marco Lang. He is the reason I say that is the there are so many different movements that he made when he was with Lang and Heim. 
I mean, and they're they're different, and they're you know all of them have their very low frequency, which I happen to like. You put a diamond in the uh, uh, the shaft of at the top of the shaft of the uh, balance wheel. So I would say he's one of them. Uh, Jean Marc Viterec is another one. That's that's and and so is Agenor. I mean those I. Because every time I, I I see what they do, it's really incredible. I would include um, Philippe Dufour. I mean, his his finishing and that is really amazing. Uh, probably Roger Smith. I would include him too in the best. I'm trying to think. That's a, that's a really good question, uh, Caesar. I'm trying to think. Um. You know, um, who else is there? I don't know. Who, who do you guys think is the best? That's, the, that's sort of an interesting question. George Daniels by doing everything by hand. Yeah, and uh, it's, I guess that would include Roger Smith. Yeah. Yeah, no, he he certainly uh, he's he's not around. I thought you meant contemporary ones. <laughs> you know, well, I think it's Abraham Louis Breguet, <laughs> Diamond Cap, uh, or what high quality pocket uh, watch? It oh, back in the day, of all timers, Breguet. Yeah, it's a I I. I, I tell you, when, now that they've been swatchized, uh, I think they've lost that. I think the best ones were the ones that Abraham Louie made and uh, Daniel Roth made in the 80s, I think. Dufour and Daughter. What era did uh, Mark Lang make watches at Lang and Heim? He started it. Uh, I think he was there for maybe the first 20 years. He left, and I think, because shortly after I got my watch, I think it was 19, 2018, I think. Maybe 2018 either was his last year or the year he left. Um, and uh, Lang, uh, I mean, uh, Hein was there for the first year and then went back and worked for uh, Alanga. The and so Marco was there pretty much from I think almost 2000 to 2018 or 19. Yeah, well, Daniel Roth is still with us too. Was it 2018, Aloysius? It could have been. Yeah, I think I'm, I, I think it was sometime in that year or just after. Or I, I don't know how what exactly it was. Oh, yeah, John. You're right. The pretentious, all the pretentious watchmakers. <laughs> we, we are the... <laughs> The, the curd of the 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 curd that runs to the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good, Daniel. <laughs> Oh, let's see. What are some other tips for finding a good watch? You know, I, I think one of the things that Rancher said earlier that I hadn't really thought about is simply knowing people and uh, sort of making contact. I got this one. I could. This was another watch I couldn't afford. And a guy out of the blue contacted me from, he worked in a bank in Oman. And said, hey, Bill, they're having a half-price sale. 
uh, through this bank I work at. If you're still interested, uh, they had they made some deal with Lang and Heim, and you can get get a watch for half price. And that was what I did. <laughs> so I, and that was because I, I knew a guy, and then he put me in touch with somebody, and uh, then I, you know, went through some stuff. That's another way too. I mean, if you're looking for something, if you're looking for something specifically, like a, a lot of people have asked me some different things. Uh, one has been, um, oh, the Chanel Monsieur. That thing, that watch has. That thing is an amazingly wonderful watch, and like everybody else, I couldn't afford it. And all of a sudden, uh, there was this deal right in front of me, <laughs> so I took it. And the price keeps going up. Those things are up to forty-seven thousand now, and um, <laughs> it's just spiraling upward. And it's Chanel. People say, ah, oh, it's got a crummy resale value. I don't care. <laughs> but it doesn't have a crummy resale value. Uh, okay. He works in a bank. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here we go. Oh, Dominic, yeah. You know what is great about going to a watch show, at least for me? I love meeting the other guys there. I, I, I tell you, the last one we went to, <laughs> you were there, Dominic. Some other guys were, too. We, I, I, <clears throat> I spent hardly any time <clears throat> excuse me, going around to the different booths. <laughs> I spent all my time that we we there was a near a, right next to a bar I might add just talking and talking and yakking about watches and to me that's a lot of fun. I don't know whether I I, I got a found a deal there or not <clears throat> but I could have Hi Sensu. I'm not sure how popular <clears throat> Amacon and Darwell watches are outside of the Balkans, but they can be found at very good prices. Oh, that's good to know. You're right. I don't. I I hadn't heard of either one of them. Moser should give you a discount as you promote them a lot. Yeah, I agree. I ought to give me a hundred percent discount, <laughs> Caesar. I you know I have two H Mosers. And, and there are two of the watches I like so much. I'd never really sell them. And I'm not sure. <laughs> I think there are some Mosers I, I I wouldn't mind having. But I've got, God, I tell you, I've got too many watches now that I want to wear every day. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, this is another one. And then I have another one coming, I hope, next week. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> Do you know how it works to make a collab with Moser? I've seen a few companies doing. Yeah, that might be. A, that's a really good idea. I think some guys. I don't think it was Red Bar. There's another group like Larik, but it's not like Larik. Uh, what they do is that I think they they get a bunch of guys together. I don't know how many. They work out something. They they worked out a deal with um, H Moser for a watch that was pretty much one of their standard off the shelf watches, and then they put a bezel on it or a movable. I mean, a rotating bezel or something like that. I think that's a great idea, I, I, and I would assume, or at least I would hope, that uh, H Moser gave him a break on it. <laughs> you have money when no one else does. That's true. Oh, well, you got a lot of money. That's, I don't know. It's, I wouldn't mind having a lot of money, but it's not as, you don't have to think as much about it. Every little thing, um, 
you got to sort of figure in your budget and all of the other things and whether or not your wife is going to brain you to get caught. <laughs> you know, there are more things. If you got oodles and oodles of money, it's just like, you, you know, you sort of point, I want that one, and it comes. Well, now, what fun is that? I wouldn't mind finding out, though. Amalgamations. H. Moser watched that was influenced uh, by all the main... Oh, uh, watch, Nicholas. It's called the Icon Watch. God, I love that watch, too. That is such a neat watch. A group in Australia did a streamliner tourbillon in uh, yellow gold. Wow. Uh-oh, it's frying pan time. Yep, <laughs> it is. Okay, guys, um, this afternoon, uh, we got to talk some more. At 4 o'clock, New York time. Uh, let me see. I think that would be 8 p.m. Um, GMT time. Right now, there's a uh, an offset. The U.S. is on. Uh, daylight saving times and everybody else or some other ones are on standard some on daylight i don't know anyway uh, i will take as i always do i will take uh advice from the rancher as what would be a good topic take care guys hope to see you this afternoon